Yes, hello. Welcome to Talk To Me Thursday. And this is, boy, it's a gorgeous day. And uh, we're here. Yes. Thank you for joining with us today, those of you faithful during the week. And we're so thankful to be able to even do this. This is like an amazing blessing, provision for us. And so we're going to just take full advantage of it. And those of you that know and understand what's happening today with the, the broadcast, this is your chance to direct where the broadcast is going to go. Um, your questions, your comments, I'm going to open it up early in the broadcast for you to interject your thoughts. And wherever those begin, we will end up in the Word of God by the grace of God. So uh, that's how we roll on Thursdays. Talk to me Thursday. So get your thoughts um, ready and prepared, and we're going to have a great broadcast today. And I just want to mention, want to thank everyone that joined us for our Wednesday prayer time at noon. And it was amazing, the visitation and, you know, the time just flew. We were like an hour and 20 minutes in and it just, in fact, the camera battery went dead for a moment <laughs> because we went, but it didn't seem like that. It really didn't seem like that. And so uh, it's so good. Thank you, Lord, to having the Holy Spirit energize our prayer life. It's not dry. It's not, it's not to be a duty or, or a demand because of what the circumstances are, but joy. And we talked about that yesterday. So it was yesterday's broadcast, this archive. You can get that um, either on Facebook Live, uh, Periscope, and also on YouTube Live if you care to uh, get that. And don't forget, friends, our shutdown schedule, okay, and we're on cue. We're uh, doing all of these broadcasts by faith, and and uh, thank you for joining with us. Tomorrow, we will be, we won't have a broadcast tonight. Tonight is family night. I promised my wife that we would, it would be her and I, her and me. How about that? You know, I never get that right. In any case, she knows what we're talking about. And, um, uh, so then Friday, tomorrow at 11 a.m. And then 6 p.m. will be down. Does it say 6? It says 7 p.m., but it should be 6 p.m. We will be down at uh, Maryland Bible College and Seminary. There won't be any students there, but you, okay. And uh, we'll be teaching out of the, uh, we're, the doctrine of worship and praise. Worship and praise. That's tomorrow evening. 6 p.m. from Maryland Bible College and Seminary. Eric, thank you so much for your piano rendering there. Okay, so I'm sending this out um, for each of, uh, let's see, what did that tell me? That tell me, GG Chess Features, I was like, okay, okay, everybody's, everybody's on board. Okay, so there you go. And um, you can send your comments your prayer requests, yeah, we can still pray, and uh, all of that uh, on today's broadcast. And for those of you that got the devotional thought this morning, it really was kind of provoking out of Ruth. But we'll touch on that uh, in just a few moments, but not too much, because you are the ones that are going to direct the broadcast. But let's pray. Father, thank you that we are here, you are here. That's what matters. And the visitation of the Holy Spirit is the distinctive difference in any of this, God. We are not fancy. We are not sophisticated. We are not the best. You are the best. We give glory to you today. Bless this broadcast. Bless each one that will participate in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So, send your comments and uh, let's get started on today's uh, Talk to me Thursday. And uh, yeah, as you send those comments and questions in, I'll respond to those. But I wanted to bring up, uh, I'm pretty sure I did, <laughs> the uh, amazing, amazing uh, portion out of the book of Ruth today. And it really, it really illustrated what 
you know, what can happen in the life of even God's people here? Because this is exactly uh, what happened as it was with Ruth. And, um, and we want to see this here. Why? Okay, I, 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 I just want the, the broadcast, okay? <laughs> I just want the portion. I know where I can go for that. So, um, the story of Ruth is, is an amazing story because it, it, it interjects the, as we taught uh, Tuesday night, the sovereignty of God and the, the volition of man. And the reason is because in that book, you have, you have you know, the Jewish people, and then you have um, the, the Gentiles or the, the heathen or the unsaved, those outside of the Jewish community. And through intermarriage now, there's something, and that, that was culturally a violation of, of uh, what they were supposed to do. But then it brings into, in chapter one, and this is where our portion came out, that, that uh, Ruth uh, and her Oprah, her sister, were given a choice. They were given a choice, actually. And actually, you know, they weren't really given the choice. Na uh, Naomi said, listen, go back to your people. There's no future with me. God has dealt uh, severely with me. It's, it's great, Pat. It's great portion. So she says, go back to Moab, to your people and your gods, plural, gods. All right. And so... The, the picture here, and then um, Oprah takes her up, takes her up on that, and she goes back. But Ruth, Ruth, it says she claved unto Naomi. Now, there's, there's deep significance in the names, in the places, okay, and in the process here. Uh, Naomi, her name means beautiful grace, beautiful grace. And she, with her husband and her two son-in-laws, left out from Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Okay. The house, uh, uh, you know, of bread, the house of peace. Okay. And that was their provision. But they left that. And this harkens unto uh, a couple of New Testament portions whereby, um, uh, we think of the, the prodigal son, the prodigal son. But, you know, there's more than, you know, more than just the son who is the major player in that, in that teaching. And, you know, how that uh, he left out with his inheritance. He got, from, he got from his father what he wanted. And then he left out with that provision. He went out healthy wealthy and wise, <laughs> but he got wasted. He got wasted away. And everything that, that he was supporting himself, himself, you know, uh, wasted away. This is the same picture that we get here with Naomi. She went out full, it says. And this is, this is what she says about herself. She says, I, I went out full from Bethlehem, but I came back empty. And we simply said that this is this is how it can be when we have second loves or multiple things that we love, and we in the love of other things we leave first love. And we went to Revelation two and verse four because this was something that the Lord had said about a specific church. He says that you have left your first love, your first love. And it doesn't just mean in terms of, you know, when I first got saved and I just like was like ecstatic with God, you know, like it's amazing. But the relationship of priority, the relationship of priority, that God is first in my life. Now, it is true that other things come and compete with that. And I need to know how to deal with that. I need to know, like, what is what is that to me? It is it is an enticement. It is a seduction. It's not that those things in of themselves may necessarily not be bad. It could be something as significant 
as my family. Now listen carefully, because this is this is Bible teaching for me to think correctly. When Jesus was teaching in the temple, it says that his mother and brothers came desiring to see him, desiring to speak with him. And then someone spoke up in the in the Bible study and says, Lord, Lord, you know, your mother and your brothers are outside. They, they want to see you. They, 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 they want to talk to you. Now, I, you know, just we can understand that. Sure, time out. Let me go out and see what my mother wants. Okay, let me, let me, I'll be back. But the Lord said this, and he said, who? He asked the question, who is my mother and my brothers? And he looked around in the room. He looked around at those that were already there. And he said, behold, look, here are my brothers, and here are my sisters. They that, what, hear the word of God and keep it. Man. So what was that? That was a readjustment of priorities culturally, socially. Uh, you know, the, the Norman standard was like family, family. Now, the Lord wasn't dissing family, but he was exalting the relationship that could be had with himself. This is the thing, ladies and gentlemen. Like, what is really the first place? Well, I'm finished. I don't want to talk. This is Talk to Me Thursday. <laughs> so send your comments and your questions in. And uh, we love. Yeah, SWS is in. Talk to Me Thursday. Good morning, everyone. I like that sunshine, too. So what is it that you want to discuss? What is it that you want to, your thoughts, okay? And I trust that. I know that you're thinking, okay? So take time. Um, Facebook Live, you find the comments. I, You know, I don't, I'm not that gifted with Facebook, but I know there's a place where you can type in some comments. So go ahead and do that. And then, of course, Periscope. I, I know Periscope, and you know how you can just type your comments down below. And uh, so let's get this discussion, Okay. Yeah, R. Campbell says that was amazing. He was not just addressing Jews. Yes, exactly, with that statement. And, and this is how we should read the Bible this way. Now, this is, this is interesting. We should read the Bible this way. You say, yeah, I, I know how to read. Okay, and just follow along with me here. There is the person who goes to the Bible and they are seeking something to speak to them, seeking something to endorse themselves. Listen carefully. Seeking something to endorse. They, you know, like I'm living my own life here. But you know what? I mean, God, I know that you're important. And you know what? what you know, give me something that tells me I'm okay. okay. Not, not in redemption. I'm okay in the flesh. That's what. They do. Then there's a group when they approach the word of God. They are humbly wanting the word to speak to them. They got nothing to say. You know, they got nothing to say. You know what I mean? They, they've got no agenda. They're wanting the Lord's agenda. Okay. So they, you know, ek a Jesus, ek out, the out from the scriptures, the scriptures speak. Okay. Now here's something I think this is also interesting is that, um, uh, when I go to the scriptures that way, I can place myself in the position of the person or persons that are being spoken of. In other words, I could see myself uh, as Naomi. I could see myself going out. I could see myself as the prodigal, you know, and I've got I got other interests. I got other priorities. I got I got what I'm looking for in life. I'm, I'm going to create my own destiny. And this is this is the narrative out in the world, you know. Like, do your thing, pursue your interests. And it's not that those things aren't wrong in of themselves, but they've taken the front seat. They they've just taken the front seat. So, the prodigal went out rich, and those loves that he pursued, uh, betrayed him. They forsook him. And now he's facing himself, looking at the swine husk, not even the swine. Hey, hold on. But feeding off of that which the swine 
or feet. You know, it's like that's like saying you know, the low of the lowest, the vile of the vilest. And all that really is illustrating is that you can go as far as you can go and get as low as you can go. And still there is a place to return, to return, to come home. Because the Father, the Father never stopped looking for that return. He never stopped looking. In fact, because he was looking, he was the first one to see the prodigal coming down the path, coming home. So listen, so he simply said this, when, when your other loves <laughs> forsake you, and they will, they will because they can't sustain you, they can't sustain you, then the Lord, the Lord will bring you back to himself, to his house, where there's fullness. And you know the rest of the story about the prodigal son. Okay. All right. SW says, um, the unjust steward. Can you amplify on that a little bit? Um, meaning, I mean, you know, what is it? The unjust steward. Was that, the, you're, you're speaking of the one that got the talent but buried it? Uh, is, that, is that your reference there? Can it be? Okay. Unjust steward. Oh, okay. No, Luke 16 and verse 8. Luke 16, parable of the unfaithful steward. This is this is quite interesting. So, uh, SWS, what is it that you want to say? Why is the unjust steward commended? Yes, okay. Great question. Great question. Why has that happened? Okay, let's see if we, Lord, help us. Help us to understand this, okay? Okay, number one, it's a parable. Number one is a parable. So a parable does not teach categorical doctrine. A parable, parabolos, it, the, the word para alongside, balo meaning to throw. You know, I get a, get a good picture of a bocce ball. I don't know. I don't know anything about bocce ball. I just see, you know, like they have a green, you know, and they roll the ball down. And it's all about position with the balls knocking. Okay, so you understand. Parabolo, okay? So the Lord is teaching parabolically here, all right? And uh, so that puts it in a, in, a, in a category, takes it out of the category of teaching objective categorical doctrine, but illustrative of a principle, an illustration of a principle, because basically it uses, it uses items that everyone can understand both in the contemporary time in which Jesus taught it. So the parable of the sower and the seed, okay? So in agrarian society, we all know seed, we all know sowing, we all know crops, we all know, you know, and we can understand it in the 21st century too. So here it is. And um, so what did the steward do? Well, first and foremost, in verse 3, he took an assessment of his condition. Now he was, he was, Poised to be released by uh, the rich man who had given this steward. And I want you to notice here, the steward. He's not an owner. He's a steward, which means he's a manager. He's responsible, but he's not an owner. He's responsible, but he's not an owner. And so he uh, was accused that, he, that the Lord, that he had wasted the rich man's goods. Now, what what is that? Wasted, used, lost? What is it? This sets up the premise for this parable, and it's very important to to think about it. Okay. Now, here's here's the setup. Um, the rich man gave the steward full responsibility. Okay, to do right with what he was given. There seems to be here that there was an accusation that he was wasting his stuff. Now, what, what could the rich man do? The rich man could say, okay, show me what you have done with what I have given you. Show me what you have done with what I've given you. So, 
And if he didn't have anything to show, then the indictment would be, you know, like, what are you wasting my, you know, wait, are you wasting what I'm giving you? And in a way, it's like the Lord could ask us, I have given you, you are a steward of your life. You, you don't own your life. The psalmist says, um, we have not made ourselves. You know, the Lord has made us. We have not made ourselves. John the Baptist says, what man has anything that didn't come down from heaven? Okay. So what have I done as a steward with my life? Okay. So now um, the interesting thing was that the steward was to bring back um, an effect and a result of, of what the rich man gave him. So he did this, but it says that he, he took an assessment of where he is. And so the steward said unto himself, what shall I do? Uh, for my Lord takes away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig and to beg I am ashamed. So I am resolved, verse 4, to what I should do. Okay. And uh, he goes to the Lord's debtors. He goes to yeah, his Lord's debtors. And he says into the verse, you know, how much, do, how much do you owe? We're going to strike a deal here. And the purpose was that he could come back now with a return on the investment. Okay. He could show this is the return on the investment. So he went to uh, the first and he said, take your bill and sit down. You, you owe a hundred. Write 50. That was a 50% discount. But he had it in his hand. He had he had none before. No payment before. But now he gets and he gets half of the payment. He's got something. Okay. And then the next he says, How much you owe? 100 measures a week. Take your bill, write four score 80. So now you got a little bit more from the from the wheat man. Okay. <laughs> and uh, then um, and so he comes back to the Lord, the rich man, and he says, here's a return on your investment. You know, here's, here's a fulfillment on that. And, okay, so what happened? Well, not only did he please, you know, gave a discount to those who owed him, but he also had something to show to the Lord and the master. Then it says this, um, and the Lord commended, this is your question, verse 8, the unjust do it. Well, he was unjust, not because he did something wrong, but because he did something for himself. Hello. He did something for himself because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wise and the children of light. And, uh, and then he goes on to say, let me make sure I got the right question here. Uh, 16, 8. Yeah, that's the question. Okay. So he is, he is commended because he did something that set him up for his own security. Now, remember, this is a parable, a parable alongside of. In this world, people will do what they will do to preserve themselves. In the world system, we are prone to like do that which at least works well for us, okay? So you say, well, what is the Lord teaching here? He's really going to be teaching because, we, of course, the context, good Bible student gets the full context. In verse 13, he nails it. Jesus nails it. Because you know what? The parable is kind of like leading them on. And, you know, the, the listeners saying, yes, 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 yes. I understand. Steward, Lord, property, you know, no money. Show. He gets, you know, 50 from here, he gets 80 from there. He's working, he's working it, man. Yes, and he goes. And he's got, you know, the people that he discounted, when they when they see him again, they're, hey, my friend, thank you for giving me a discount. Come on in, listen, I got dinner for you. So he was thinking, you know, I go back to these people and they'll, they'll welcome me, okay? I'm not an adversary. But notice what it says, because he was serving something. In verse 13, no servant can serve what? two masters. I can't serve myself and Christ at the same time, which is what the unjust steward did. But in the economy of the world system, that appears to be wise. 
Yes, it does. Listen to this. Um, that for the children, this is verse 8, for the children of what? This world. This world. When? This world. Nothing about eternity. This world. For the children of this world, okay, are in this in their generation wiser than the children. Look, locative condition here. Location, this world, in this generation. It appears as if they, they are winners. It appears as if, you know, that's turning the temporal value system as to being the thing that you should be about. And you serve it. You serve it. You are enslaved to it. You are obligated to it. But when you get born again, when you've been translated, the Bible says, from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son, then what happens? I got another master. I got another Lord. And he's not demanding these things from me. He's saying, you no longer have to serve that, <clears throat> that kingdom. You no longer have to serve that taskmaster, money, because he says it. I can neither serve, either I'll hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So when we serve God, we're not operating according to these principles outlined in this parabolus, okay? This parable, teaching this principle. So what did the Lord do? He led them up to, they said, yeah, man, I understand that. I know what you mean. And then he said, oh, my goodness, guess what? You can't serve both at the same time. Ooh, got to make a choice. Got to make a choice. Got to make a choice. Well, in any case, that's very, anyone else have anything? I like that game. Okay. You do? Well, okay. There's, there's a limitation on that because uh, Jesus says this. He says, wise is the man that lays treasure up where? In heaven, where neither moth nor rust nor thieves break in and steal. Yeah. So whatever we treasure, the location of where we treasure our treasure is vitally important. It is vitally important. Okay, so the parable is illustrating the virtue of prudence. It's a nice 25 cent word. The unjust steward was stealing. Yes, he was. Yes, yeah, yeah, he was, you know. Um, and it is teaching that, but I hope we threw some some fresh oil on, on that thinking there. Uh, okay, our campus says 2 Kings 14, uh, 6. Wow, this is good. States. You're not responsible for the sins of the father. How do we reconcile 2 Kings 10, verse 11? Okay, let's take a look at this. First, 2 Kings 14, 6. 2 Kings 14, 6. These are great questions. And let's get uh, 2 Kings 14, 6. And then... 2 Kings 10, 11. Okay, here we go. 2 Kings 10. I had a great time this morning with my grandson. Uh, he's got Bible in his home school. You know, everybody's homeschooling these days. Okay, and uh, he got me on Facebook to help him. Okay, 2 Kings 10, 11. Is that right? So Jehu slew all that remained of the house of Ahab in Jezreel and all his great men. Oh, yes. And his kinfolks and his priests until he left nothing remaining. Okay, so here's here's the two portions together. And uh, this is a great question. Uh, where are you here? Here, here, here. Okay. And all right. Second Kings 14, 6. I thought I had that. Okay, but the children of the murderers he slew not, according unto the, that which is written in the book of the law of Moses, wherein the Lord commanded, saying, The fathers shall not be put to death for the children, nor the children be put to death for the fathers, but every man shall be put to death for his own, what? Sin. Sin. Context. Okay. Now, in the ancient world, when 
And this even happened, you know, with Solomon. Okay. He had to deal this, you know. So you have sin dealing here, 2 Kings 14, okay, and verse 6. Then you have the the verse in, in 10, 11, dealing with politics, politics, government. Okay. When when a, a new king would come into power and there were siblings, there were siblings that would, you know, and that was the case with Solomon also. They, you know, so that there would not be this, you know, subterfuge or this, you know, conspiracy, this, you know, conniving, wanting to take the throne. You, you would just kill off the entire rest of the, of the family members because of politics. But here, in 2 Kings 14, 6, it's talking about um, that, you know, the, the, the sins of my father are not given, not, do not extend down to the sons or the other generations, okay, just because they're related, okay, just because they're related. So I think both say what they say, but I need to see the setting. One is dealing with individual sins the other is dealing with political political table a, you know that you you want to get rid of your rivals okay and that's how that rolled <laughs> you know thank god we have votes now instead of arrows or swords you know if you want to get somebody out of office you don't go out and assassinate them you vote them out lord willing okay um good point good point okay SWS, as you mentioned, the ancient world, how did the early church operate? What did those people believe? How early did you want to get SWS? Okay, because when we say the ancient world, I'm probably, I'm, I'm thinking the culture, the culture, okay? But if we also understand that in the ancient world, you have Israel as God's people, as a nation, and then you had other nations also in the ancient world. And so we look at the Jewish nation and we find that God was so intimately involved that it just said, like, what nation has a God so close to them? That's an amazing statement. What nation, what other nation out here? Oh, they got deities. Yeah, they got, you know, they've got their own gods, but their gods are idols. They don't see. They have eyes, but they don't see. They have tongues, but they don't speak. They have feet, but they don't walk. You got to carry them around, okay? But Israel had an invisible God everywhere present. And the beautiful thing was that, um, so they had that as their relationship to their God. So now, uh, ancient world, the, the big picture is that you've got of all the nations and all their cultures and all their accomplishments and all their achievements, you've got this group of people, na nation of Israel, Abraham's descendants. When, when Abram went down, okay, and, you know, out of there, 75 people out of there came a nation. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting that it is this way. Now, um, what was the other to be part? Okay, then you said the early church. How did they operate? Well, the early church was made up of who? Jews. Okay. And yet, the, to be a believer in Jesus Christ, in the finished work, what did they have to do? The Jews, those Jews had to forsake their, their national identity. What do we mean by that? Well, when Paul would preach the finished work, faith in Christ and Christ alone for salvation, Jews came along behind and says, yeah, okay, we, we understand what Paul is saying, but you also must be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. This became a big riff in the early church. And uh, they had to go back to Jerusalem. And there was discussion, Peter, and, you know, what was God doing with the Gentiles? And, and Paul came back and gave this glowing report of, like, what the Lord was doing with the Gentiles. And they said, okay, Paul, you be the apostle to the Gentiles. 
Peter, you be the apostle to the Jews. Okay, notice that distinction. But yet it wasn't a, a distinction unto separation, it was a distinction unto approach. Okay, but then we find very beautifully that uh, Peter understood and got, got his thinking changed because he kind of, you know, he went along with the finished work until there was a delegation, you know, from Jerusalem that came down to see what Peter was up to. And Peter, it says, he withdrew his fellowship from the, the Gentile believers because the, you know, his Jewish brothers were hanging out, you know, like, wow, you know, like, I can't let them see me do this because they might, you know, they, okay. Paul called him on the carpet and said that was not right. Paul said, listen, you know, you got to straighten that out. That's got to be straightened out. And he confronted Peter to his face. Well, Peter also got a revelation of this in uh, Acts chapter 10. And that's a great chapter, SWS. You want to read that, Acts chapter 10, because that was when Peter had the dream before lunchtime. And the sheet was let down three times. Inside was unclean animals, according to Jewish culture, according to what they followed for centuries. And Peter said in his, in his Jewishness, he said, uh, you know, God said, rise up, kill and eat. He says, no, no unclean thing has ever passed my lips. Not, I'm kosher all the way. Well, that was true. But then God said, don't let any man call unclean what God calls clean. Okay. Leading him into, and then the Lord said, listen, there's going to be some men knocking on your door, and you're going to go down to a Gentile's house, Cornelius's house. You're going to go down to a Gentile's house asking nothing. That's, that's amazing, because that meant that he had to go down there by obedience and faith, because he said, man, a Gentile's house, like, yeah, you know, what happens if somebody sees me? What happens if, like, you know, I guess the no question. Don't ask any questions. He got there. He got there. Cornelius was there in all of his household, like this big crowd, like, wow, what happened here? All right. And because an angel told him, an angel, this is amazing. An angel told him, you got to go and you got to get Peter to come down here to preach what? The gospel. But wait a minute. You're an angel from the presence of God. Can't you tell me? Mm -mm. The gospel the gospel message has been committed to the church, to believers, okay? <laughs> you know, angels take a back seat. So here it is. So he's preaching. And while he was preaching, it says that the Holy Spirit fell on these Gentiles. Oh, my gosh. Like Just like in Acts 2. And what was the connection? You know. Peter made the connection. If God was going to pour out the Spirit on the Gentiles like he did with us in Acts 2, then there's no distinction, no difference, and no separation. Bang! No need for circumcision, okay? And the culture, you know, like you got to obey the law of Moses. No, the Holy Spirit, which was the gift. Man, the gift. It's amazing because that's how they, they understood it. Okay. SWS is the apostles, Jews, and Gentiles. Okay, did the apostles have disciples? Uh, yes, the disciples. Uh, the, 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 now, you, are you thinking of the, of the disciples? Because that's, that's actually, that's a, that's, a, uh, that's a category, okay? But that's also a relationship, okay? And if we understand the word disciples, it's learned ones, learned ones. And it's the idea that that I get instructed, taught, and uh, and I follow. I'm following the example, okay, of the one who's teaching me, uh, and that's important. Okay, so okay, what did these people believe? Okay, and the apostles' doctrine. That's good. I mean. What, what did the early church believe? The doctrine being taught by the apostles. Okay? Now, what, I should ask you this question. I think I will. Okay, SWS. What does the, the word apostle 
mean? What is it? What is it translate? What is it translated from to where it's in your Bible? Um, the word, the King James, there for apostles. What is? What is it? Okay. Can you name any of the direct disciples of the apostles? The direct. Um, again, the category is based on a relationship, not a name. You know, like a, a, a what do they call that? You know, a genealogy. It's not related on a genealogy. Okay. Paul talked about, uh, and he was talking to the Corinthian church, you know, and he said, you know, I, I'm glad that I have not baptized anyone, but he lists like four people, I think it is, that he baptized. Because why? The emphasis was related who baptized you. Okay. Not what baptism meant, but who baptized you? It would be like to say, um, you know, who, who, what university did you graduate from? What diploma do you have? Okay, I'm glad that you got a diploma. But there's many other diplomas out there, okay? This one is not the exclusive only diploma to be had, okay? So, again, it's that relationship, that relationship that is, okay, also mean one who is sent off. Uh, yes, is sent out. And, and I think the, the key word is sent. He's not, he's not called, he's not doing what he wants to do the way he wants to do it when he wants to do it. He's on a mission. He's on a mission. Okay? And that's so good. So then R. Campbell says, from Paul, there was Timothy. There's a great example. Yeah, Paul invested in Timothy. And what did Paul call Timothy? He didn't just call, he didn't call him a disciple. He called him what? Son. See, the emphasis is on the relationship. And then we have, uh, and this is this is I think is is very important. This relationship, this relationship exists today, um, and it, it really. It really is important. Okay, 2 Timothy 2, verse 2. Listen to, listen to the language. I know you will. Therefore, my son. Therefore, this is Paul talking to Timothy. Therefore, my son, be strong in the, the declension, the line, the genealogy, the lineage. No, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strong in that. And the things that you have heard of me. Wow. What did I, where did Timothy get this? He got this from Paul. He got this from Paul. Should I go? I'll go there. He didn't get it from Peter. He got it from Paul. Peter's talking to other people, yes, but he, he didn't get it from Peter. He got it from Paul. Okay. Those things which you have heard of me among many witnesses, because listen, I wasn't doing this, you know, in a corner somewhere. My ministry was public. My ministry was to reach many. My ministry was to reach many. And if I thought of it, you know, like my ministry is not just to reach greater grace Christians. I'm talking about the church now. Greater grace world outreach Christians. That's not the extent of my ministry. My ministry is to, is to reach many, some of whom I will never see face to face because they, you know, they've got this digitally and, and you're on another part of the globe. But the message is the same. So he says, those, those things that you've heard of me among many witnesses, the same, the same what? Message. But a different relationship because Paul is talking to Timothy and Timothy is going to be talking to someone else who's going to be talking to someone else. Now watch this. So he has uh, said, those things that you've heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit to what? Faithful men. Faithful men. Man, that was the qualification, not, you know, association, but faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So a, a disciple becomes a disciple. Okay? A disci if, if I'm properly discipled, if I've been properly discipled, and thank God for the ones who have discipled me, and it's been more than one person, but I'm, I'm, I'm receiving it then I am able to disciple others. Because those things that I heard didn't originate with me. 
okay? And I pass them on. So, great question, and uh, that's that's where we're, where we're at, okay. Uh, Ignatius of Antioch, Polycarp, all of these, you know, these are, these are individuals, and the only reason we hear of these individuals and um, they, you know, they're, uh, you know, the, the names of these individuals, okay, and because they wrote, they wrote, okay, and so these men, okay, all of these men, all these men were taught by the apostles. What did they believe? Well, they, they, they had the scriptures. And by the way, you know, the, the idea, we have the scriptures, and, you know, I could have the scriptures, and that is my relationship to Jesus Christ. Are you listening? I can have the scriptures, and that is the relationship that I'll have with Jesus Christ. And the scriptures will lead me to himself. Will lead me, it won't lead me to the apostles. Are you listening? It won't lead me to the apostle. It will lead me to Jesus Christ and the mind of God and God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And if I never had a horizontal experience that we call church, and what do we call church is very interesting. It's very interesting. There are multitudes of our dear brothers, all right, who cannot take communion because the building's closed. The gathering's been closed. But what do they have? I'm always interested when somebody's outside walking. What do we have? We have the Bible. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the Word of God. And yes, though we're separated geographically, we are one through the filling of the Holy Spirit who always glorifies Jesus Christ. Okay. Okay. Lisa says, why did Paul and Barnabas have a disagreement. Personality, human beings. Okay, what was the issue? John Mark was a family member of uh, Barnabas. And John Mark kind of like, you know, he kind of flaked off. He, he got in a situation and it became too difficult. And in essence, he said, I'm out of here. Okay, uh, I'm going home. I'm going home. So Paul is saying, like, I don't know if I want this kind of guy on my team. Barnabas was saying, yeah, I know, but he's my cousin, you know, like, he's okay, he'll come through that. And they, you know, bang, had a riff on that. And so Paul and Silas now go as team two, okay? And then, you know, Barnabas goes. But we don't hear much more concerning Barnabas. Uh, the great encouragement, he had a great ministry of encouragement. And I know that God used him, but as far as the scriptural uh, reference, he kind of fell off the landscape. But John Mark comes back on the scene. And you know, it's a beautiful thing because in essence, something happened with John Mark, though he was like dissed to not join, um, you know, Paul and Barnabas. But then something happened in, in uh, Paul's life. And Paul repented, and he said, And send John Mark, for he is profitable unto me. And you see and get the sense of something happened, and it was a reconciliation. So even though these amazing, amazing, effective, anointed, uh, and prosperous in the spiritual sense, and key men, had this dividing asunder. And you say like, oh my gosh, that was the dream team. That was the dream team, Paul and Barnabas, man. But you know what? It didn't stop the work of God. And then God worked in those individual lives to bring about, years later, yes, but a reconciliation. It's a precious story, very good story. So, uh, SWS says, no, what, what in reference, what, what part are you saying the, the no to? What, what were you saying that to? Please be a little bit more specific. Great question. So, so Lisa, I hope that that uh, answered your question. You know, we, we can have, you know, we can have personality uh, friction. 
obviously. We're dealing with human beings. And, uh, and even as, as you know, effective and as, as amazing that these guys were, they did have the apostles had the Old Testament, not the New Testament. That's correct. That's correct. So, I don't, I don't um, please make reference to what, what that refers to. SWS. Therese, hey, wow. Kindly intercede for my son, Jeff. Okay. Like Joseph in the Old Testament, he went to prison here in Sweden. His lawyer is going to appeal to the Supreme Court after the verdict yesterday. He was incarcerated for 10 months now. That's how it is here in a socialist country. You know, good point, Therese. They can just lock you in by uh, mere words of the accusers. Wow. No ingoing phone calls allowed. His two kids were not allowed to see him. He was able to call me yesterday, and he read to me Psalm 50, 15 and 91. I'm glad he's still fully trusting in the Lord. Um, He's calm because of the Holy Spirit. Thank for the family of God and prayers. Wow. Lord, we pray for Jeff. Lord, amazing. In a socialist setting, he's locked up because of words without, without representation, without what's called here habeas corpus, held without a trial, without reason. But we have that here. That's one of the safeguards that was built in to the Bill of Rights in this country. But in the socialist country, they don't have that. And Lord, we thank you that this man is able to read his Bible and, and it brings him comfort and calmness in a very unjust situation. And that's usually the case. Okay. And we thank you for that prayer request. And Therese, thank you for for viewing and watching the broadcast today. Okay. Uh, let's see. Lisa says, Barnabas wanted Mark and Paul Silas. Uh, yes, you said the men I named had the Bible. Yes, the Old Testament. You know, and, and pardon me if, I, if, if that label, okay, because of course, um, you know, not until you know, 96 AD did we have the canon uh, of which, you know, both the Catholics and the Protestants agree that that was the close of the scriptures. But, uh, but any reference to the scriptures had to be the reference to the Old Testament. That's exactly correct. But, you know, when Jesus was talking to the disciples, the two men that were going down the road of Emmaus, the road of Emmaus, wandering, yet yeah, leaving Jerusalem, place of peace, uh, going down the road to a mayor, wandering. Jesus came in alongside of him and, he, and he spoke from starting with Moses and the scriptures which spoke of himself. And so he's the Lord Jesus Christ. I, the Lord Jesus Christ is all up in the Old Testament. Okay. Um, R. Campbell says, outside of Paul's writings, did the other apostles have a grace message towards the Jews. Um, well, I would, I would think so. Paul, we have his letters, his epistles, okay? And, you know, he was, he was used of God and separated unto the Gentiles, okay? And had an amazing, amazing calling of God and suffered, incredibly suffered for that calling, okay, could have quit early on, all right? Um, so when you say, did the other apostles, okay, have a grace message towards the Jews? We have the Gospels, okay, and uh, James, of course, uh, we have the book of James, and there's, you know, there's grace message there. And don't, no, don't get stumbled on the second chapter there and get hung up, you know, James, James understood the grace of God. Yes, we will keep him in prayer. Thank you. Um, you're welcome, Therese. That's so important that the body of Christ, um, you know. Uh, SWS, can you can you authenticate the origin of uh, the canon didn't come till 390 A.D., not 90 
A.D. Why, why that date? What, what is it that made that date? What happened? Now, Constantine in 313 made, you know, Christi Christianity the national, uh, you know, uh, accepted religion, all right? But, um, you know, there were, there were many who, who suffered, uh, early church fathers, in fact, because of persecution on that. And, um, yes, yeah, so then, uh, let's see. That's a good question. I'm so glad. Thank you for these questions. It is it is amazing that we can we can look at these things and and uh, enjoy what 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 God wants to share with us, and we want Him to share with us. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Okay, this is not this is not addressing that. It's a false. False. No, it wasn't false. This wasn't complete. Okay. Yeah, three ninety. Where where is that um, number coming from? Okay. Okay, so these councils took place under the authority of St. Augustine, um, 354-430, who regarded the canon as already closed. Okay, Council of Carthage, 397. Okay, and uh, you know what's interesting, a AWS, I mean, that, that you know, we, we, we have a, I don't know, not a jump on history. Yeah, okay, so Constantine was emperor, um, but that didn't necessarily, uh, that gave the liberty, that gave the liberty for these kinds of questions to be answered. So on one instance, um, and then also, and this this came out of our, you know, survey of doctrine course, uh, Pastor Muhib taught on it. It was so good. Last week, he said, you know, that, that um, uh, uh, you know, Augustine, you know, uh, had brought in the the Greek influence, the Greek influence, all right? And if we think of it, so you had the Jewish nation, and you had this Greek influence, so there was a, a mix where the, the Hellenistic, Hellenistic Jews, okay? They were Jews by culture, but, but Greek by education and intellect, okay? But out of that came... The Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Old Testament. Then we had, of course, this common language. And this is kind of exciting because the common language, all right, the Koine Greek, as it were, was the very basis for the rapid uh, dissemination. You had classical Greek, which only the, the high intellectuals trafficked in, okay? But Koine was street Greek. That's where the New Testament comes in, and uh, it's quite a, quite a, you know, good, good thing. Bill Alderson, please pray for Ted. He's in the hospital with a hematoma on his kidney and lungs. Yes, he needs our prayers. Thank you, Pastor Bill. Um, and yeah, just we need that flow of information because there are people that you see and hear from that I don't, and I hear and see from people that you don't. But we need to hear and see together. So, Father, we pray for, for. Ted, what a, spe what a special person he is. God, and help those doctors who are ministering to him. Keep him safe and then also bring about a resolution of this, God. We commit it to you. And we also hold up Wyatt, God, protect, cover, and give this young child the life that you have for him. God, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so before the canon was completed, do you know how many books were being put forth as God inspired? It was progressive. And, um, you know, there were those who made it their business, okay, 
to determine and there were there were many measurements by which a you know a particular writing would be considered um, inspired number one number two consistent with the the um, revelation of the Old Testament and so that's how you know it came up to be completed but I think the real important thing in understanding that we have the you know the canon of scripture as we do now is because 500 years later you're going to have another book that's going to spawn another religion and it's called you know it's called the, the you know Islam and their references not to the Bible not to the Jewish scriptures and not to the New Testament scriptures, not to the canon that already existed, but um, this other revelation, okay, that Muhammad apparently was the one who got from God and wrote it himself, wrote it himself. He was the only one, whereas in the canon you have 1,400 years of history, and I think it's some 47 different authors, but they're all talking about the same. Anyway, that's one advantage related to breaking barriers. Hey, he's in the room. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Did teach you have a blessed day. True. Thank you. It has been a great talk to me Thursday. And uh, do do if you can, you know, stay with us on during the week. And uh, as we broadcast this schedule, this is our shutdown schedule. You know, people are home. People are home, and they're staring at the ceiling. Well, they can. <laughs> They can jump in. Need to get a phone call. Okay. Thank you, Sandy. She was in the room. Thank you for praying for us on that. Okay. Pastor Bill. Okay. Four measurements of can canicity. Thank you, Pastor. Um, authentic authorship, authority, accuracy. Okay. There we go. There's there's something that, you know, as, as far, you know, and sentimentality had nothing to do with it religious affiliation or denominational identification had nothing to do with it. Okay. SWS, there was 300 books that the early church council went through to create the canon. I'm glad they did that. <laughs> that was a big job. That was a big job. And you know what? And I am, you know, we, we, we are of most individuals. <laughs> I think of, even I'm thinking about John Knox. Okay. John Huss, so they've lost their lives. They, to translate, okay, the scriptures into the English language? You know, there's been a credible price paid for you and for me to open this book and to get the message about Jesus Christ and the gospel. And if you're watching today, and thank you for being here, you don't know Jesus Christ. I didn't say that you don't know a religion. You may know a religion, a system of beliefs, but that system doesn't reveal a person. And I'm saying that God wants to reveal himself to you through the person of Jesus Christ. He has done so. He has done so. And he died on the cross, not for his sins, because he was the sinless one, but he died on the cross for our sins, the sins of the whole world. First John 2, verse 2, that then he might be able to what? Bring us to God. I trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. In Proverbs 3, verse 5, I'm, I'm combined. Yes, okay, I, I'm with you. But I lean not to my own understanding or my own self-righteousness. But in all of my ways, I acknowledge God, him, and he will direct my path. Where is he going to take my path? The Savior who comes to rescue me takes me to God. God, okay? So, trust in Jesus Christ, not yourself, not your human goodness, not your self-righteousness, not your religiosity, none of that. Trust, cast yourself upon him, for he cares for you. Do that. And listen, you can, um, I guess I should put, next time I'm going to put up an email. Hey, you're welcome. Thank you, SW. And we, we love you too. Uh, boy, you know, I didn't have anybody from from Facebook, did I? No Facebookers today. Oh, one. Okay, Therese, thank you. God bless you, dear. All right. Um,
Wow. We, we, we are over time, but not out of time. We'll be back uh, tonight at 6 p.m. That's correct, 6 p.m. from Maryland Bible College and Seminary. You're more than welcome to join us. We're teaching on the difference. Well, not the difference. Worship and praise. Worship and praise. That'll be tomorrow uh, at 6 p.m. Okay. Oh, I got a new message here. What's that saying? Yes. Okay. Great. All right. Great. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, so let's let's bring in let's bring in my friend Eric. Where are you, Eric? Oh, Eric. Oh, there he is. Okay. And uh, you know, thank you for making this broadcast edifying because there are many that are watching, and you know, not that they're wondering. Just watching and growing and receiving and and um, you know if, if if anything this should provoke you to ask more questions and get you in your Bible if I you know like that is my prayer that it gets you in the scriptures and then you come back with some more questions okay and that's very good that's very good father thank you for this time bless and keep us each day Lord virus free virus free oh but God help those who are infected, God, touch them, heal them. We're asking that in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, friends. Thank you for being with us, and we'll be back tonight at 6 p.m.